I have the honor of honoring Myra. Um, and in the theme of paving the way, I called this talk, We Thought You Could Do It All. So over 35 years ago, Myra came to Stanford. This was actually not the beginning of her career. She had graduated from Cornell with a BS in Industrial and Labor Relations and from Tufts with an, MIT, with an MA and MIT with a PhD in economics. Uh, she had taught at the University of Ma Maryland uh, in Cal Berkeley in economics. And her focus even then was women in the labor force. I don't know what tempted her to explore Stanford. Perhaps she observed that the GSB was finally actively recruiting women. And perhaps she thought, hmm, now that they have some women in the program, maybe my research will be relevant. But as the class of 74 so eloquently put it in their recruiting video, what is a nice girl like you doing in a place like this? Boy, they could use Myra's perspective. So in 1972, Myra became a lecturer in economics at the GSB. Not any special branch of economics, just plain old have model, will travel school of economics, macroeconomics. I took an economics class from her in my first year, and I now know definitively that I am a normal standard deviant along with the rest of you. Are there any other normal standard deviants in the room? I worked at the GSB placement office when Myra arrived, and I was invited to join a women's support group. And I, I expect Myra probably sponsored these. Um, it was a pre -work, precursor to the WIM group, and those women who were um, first and second year students invited me to apply to the GSB. So I joined the class of 76. And there were about 50 of us intrepid women warriors. And it's fair to say that none of us viewed ourselves as potential captainettes of industry. This was a term that was coined by Araby Judd, a classmate of mine, who designed this really wonderful t-shirt because all of my male classmates, classmates actually referred to themselves as captains of industry. So we felt we should be captainettes. But we were all game and enthusiastic and convinced that we could put our business education to good purpose. Shortly after our arrival, we realized that there were no women faculty. In fact, there were only two women lecturers, Myra and Fran Gordon. And, and I suppose it was no surprise that one of the male faculty members confided in me that it was really a shame I was taking a place from a male who might actually used the MBA. And another pillar of our class, who um, upon receiving all honors was, was told, uh, or, or it was speculated that she must have had help because women weren't that smart. Um, but they had not re yet reckoned with Myra. Our resident, Cerebrum on a stick, who happened to have no Y chromosome. Many of us took economics or women in the labor force from Myra. Um, and we found her smart and focused and realistic and able to translate economic models into usable concepts. And she was also a model for us. She was married, she had kids, she taught a full load and met her publishing challenge. When I was writing this um, speech, I asked actually for a CV and I was stunned. I, I mean, it's 14 pages long. Myra has published over 77 books and articles in her spare time, yeah. She's on 13 boards. She's been on eight editorial boards. So to us, she really did seem, it did seem that she could do it all. She'd stay after class. She was available at all hours. She really encouraged us to form peer women support groups and it was during this time that WIM was started, and Myra was a significant um, catalyst for that. She invited peer women to support each other in every way they could, both during school and afterwards in the business world. But she kept saying to us, women couldn't do it all, and we didn't want to believe her. So after four years of, as a lecturer, Myra applied and was, de and was denied tenure at the business school. 
the rumor that we heard was that her research wasn't significant because it was focused on women in the labor market. I mean, not relevant? Not significant? I mean, we're 51% of the U.S. population. We're focused and dedicated and willing to do whatever it takes to contribute. So it was certainly significant to us. How can Myra's work not be considered significant? Because she was and she is. This was a rather radicalizing moment for all of us. And there are many from my class here tonight who can attend to this. So please raise your hands or scream and yell if you're from my class. Oh, great. And then Myra, who never met a glass ceiling that she couldn't circumnavigate, was invited to join the School of Education. And in that year, she started and founded the Center on, for Research on Women. Um, and also, she organized the very first uh, business conference for women in management, which has been going on every year, every other year since then. Um, she was also um, a founding member of the American Economic Association Committee on the Status of Women in, in the Economic Professions. And she appeared that she had found another way to pursue her interest and for us to keep her here doing meaningful and relevant work. In, in her work at the School of Education, Myra did more research. Indeed, she, she did help us understand that work-life balance is a myth, uh, that there is an actual cost to stopping out. I believe the last number was 10,000 a year per year of stopping out, Myra. It's probably inflated now. Um, that all, that you had to be careful that with part-time work, all you got was part-time pay. We began to understand that um, part-time might also only be for those who had other options to get benefits. She did research on the cost benefits of maternity leave and childcare and advocated for those ideas in government and in businesses. Um, and she showed us that the US provides fewer family benefits than many of the other developed nations. Myra lectured and she spoke and she advocated in legal testimony and in white papers that the, la the labor market should provide options for both men and women to match their labor to their family commitments. And during her tenure, My 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 Myra has been a member of the advisory board of the California Economic, uh, Office of Economic Policy and Planning and Research. She's been the chair of the National Council of Research on Women a member of the National Academy of Sciences and the Institute of Medicine, um, the, on the Committee of Allied Health Professions, a member of the College Board Committee to develop AP um, uh, exams in economics, um, and a president of the International Association for Feminist Economics. All that while um, supporting women and encouraging us to nurture each other. So Myra taught us to define our trade-offs. She invited us to measure our choices. She, sh she spread herself too thin, received many honors along the way. She, she received the um, Excellence in Education Award for um, Northern California Now in 2002, um, and the School of Education Award for Excellence in Teaching in both 1992 and 1998. And her personal story was also that of pioneering. And you all know the definition of a pioneer. They're the ones who get arrows in their backs. So she was divorced and remarried. We're delighted to have Jay here with us tonight. She was rebuffed and she reset. She shared her passages with us so that we could see what it took to keep going. She gave us countless hours of helping all of us think through our options and make intelligent and hard trade-offs. And she continued to nurture and sponsor WIM. She gave endless panels and brown bag lunches and seminars. She had classes in her home, shared all of her passages and challenges as well along the way. So Mara was a profound inspiration to me and to many of us, and I dare say a model, a model for resilience and intelligent choice. So now that you're retiring, Myra, what does that mean? I mean, I can't quite imagine you taking up either knitting or golf. So what will you do next? You have another 25 years to be productive. And is it maybe time to write our book or for you to write another book? We can't wait to see how you attack this next set of challenges and opportunities. 
And we hope and expect for you to stay actively in our midst, observing and sharing your insights. We expect you to continue to pave the way and to blaze more trails. And we hope that you find as much joy and wisdom in your next passage as we have found in your company and contributions during this one. Thank you, Myra. I know we can't expect to do it all, but we appreciate how much you have done for all of us, that elusive and insignificant 51% of the population. touched Lily and I really thank so many of you who came here tonight and Joanne and I decided that we would give a little talk together after she'd been honored as well so for the moment I'm just going to say thank you and sit back down and here's Myra I have the wonderful opportunity to introduce our next um, uh, honorary uh, person here tonight, Joanne Martin. Um, I've known Joanne for a number of years. As I mentioned earlier, I graduated in 1988, and Joanne was a, a wonderful member of the faculty when I was um, here at the GSB. And I've had the opportunity to work with Joanne um, over the last eight years as a speaker in her classes. Um, a number of the students here tonight have been uh, members of those classes, and we've had a great opportunity to, to reconnect. Um, Joanne has, uh, when you look at her background and you look at her CV, it's stunning. Um, I printed it out the other day, and I was talking about it with uh, some people at work, and they laid it out and looked at it and said, how can one person accomplish so much? Not unlike what Myra has done. 18 pages, which captures a life, um, but it doesn't really capture the life. It, it captures a body of work, um, and the body of work, which is, has mostly, uh, really all of it, been done here at Stanford as the grounding point and then spread out throughout the world to a variety of people and institutions um, and associations that have had the great joy of having worked with Joanne. Um, the basic background, a bachelor's degree from Smith, um, a PhD from Harvard, and then here at Stanford since 1977. Um, Joanne has constructed her professional life here at Stanford in such a way that she was able to accomplish the really terrific and groundbreaking professional um, work that she's done here, and at the same time bring along an enormous, successful community of women um, into the academic world, and has profoundly changed um, and transformed the academic community in the United States and around the world through her mentorship. Um, I've taken a slightly different approach to tonight's um, comments, and I, instead of reading uh, carefully and then um, uh, representing the great work that Joanne has done, I, I think that anyone that has worked with her can see the numerous professional accomplishments and can imagine them. Um, 15 honorary awards, five books, uh, 55 published articles, and even at a time when, uh, in a year that she's a retirement year, um, other uh, articles in, um, in publication and in the works. Just a, an astounding body of work, a body of intellect. But instead, 
of talking about that tonight, I wanted to go to some of her colleagues and ask them for their input about Joanne. And I just want to share their words. And these are words that I can perhaps just present to you all, but really they're being said by people that have known and worked with Joanne for the last 30 years. And some of the words, and, and I think these are spoken, I've, I've asked for one word from the people I talked to. The first word is brilliant. And I think that this is an environment where there's a lot of smart people, but there's not a lot of smart people that call someone else out as being just genuinely brilliant in their work. And I think that anyone that's worked with Joanne around the world would, would say that, and they just say truly brilliant, scary smart. And of course, everyone I said started with this, and I can only use one word, but just truly brilliant. The next word was gutsy, and then an effort to refine that, because that seemed maybe not formal enough. Courageous, brave, a pioneer, a groundbreaker. Um, Joanne's work has, uh, you know, when you think about paving the way, you go along a road that's in the process of being paved, it's very bumpy. Um, first you just crash through the trees and you create a big scar, you know, which causes pain and turmoil. And then once you crash through, you flatten it. Um, once you flatten it, you smooth it and roll it, and then you lay the pavement, and then you this constant process of re, relaying the pavement. And the, and the theme of paving the way it defines Joanne's professional career and her life um, as she has built here at Stanford and really created um, this uh, this impact around the world. Um, so definitely paving the way. The next word was passionate. Um, passionate about her work, passionate about her family, passionate about her friends, and genuine passion, not contrived passion. Genuine, down to the core passion. The next word, and it's a little bit different than, than courageous and brave, because sometimes we're brave because we have to be. Um, but other times, uh, we just are brave because we're fearless. And not everyone who's brave is fearless. Um, and Joanne is both brave and fearless. She went into situations throughout her career and it's with a sense of fearlessness and then operated in a way uh, that was incredibly brave and, and courageous. Kind. This is classic. How many, uh, it, it's so hard for a human being to be all of these things, both, both brilliant, um, gutsy, brave, passionate, fearless, and kind. But everyone I spoke to, the first thing they said was an incredibly great friend. Um, and this is not just people that have known Joanne for 30 years, but these are people that perhaps have known Joanne for two years, and they just sense that sense of kindness, the compassion, the connection. Um, and then finally, pioneer. And we're hearing a lot about that tonight. Um, and a true pioneer, I think those of us that come along behind you don't appreciate. I, I know I don't appreciate what it really takes to be a pioneer. How many days you wake up just thinking, this is really, really hard and people in your way, in your face, constantly saying it can't be done, it shouldn't be done. And I think the work that Joanne has done around the world has really paved the way for us. And this sense of being a pioneer, I think it's something you're born with. I'm not sure that many of us have it or can learn it, but Joanne has it and has been able to teach it. And the last word was beacon. And this was a word I've been thinking about for the last month, preparing for this. And I and the vision, since we live here on the West Coast, is of a lighthouse where the light is shining all the time, 24-7. And it really creates a sense of place, a sense of groundedness. Joanne's work has lived here at Stanford. Um, at Stanford and around the world, she has mentored numerous uh, female uh, PhDs and, in effect, populated excuse me, the universities around the world with these PhDs. These women would not be in the places they are today without Joanne's support, without her help, without her guidance, without her counseling and coaching and encouragement. Um, it is a different place today than it was when Joanne started here in 1977, because not only because of her work, her intellect, her brilliance, but her willingness to put that energy into other people and to send them out into the world in a supportive way and encourage their work in these other places so they could then themselves, through her modeling, bring people along. And it's a, it is creating a different world for us. And I think that issue, that, that concept of being a beacon for the work, the thinking, um, the compassion, the commitment, I think is probably the strongest thing that came across 
when we look around the GSB, when I went through in 1988, um, there are women professors. There are women, many more women professors around the world today than there, are, than there were before. We can't take this for granted. I spoke to a friend of mine that teaches at the business school, and she said that this is often very quiet work. It's lonely work. It's not obvious. You don't, it doesn't show up on the CV how many people you've mentored. It doesn't show up how many people have stayed in their work and then gone on to mentor other people. But perhaps that's one of the accomplishes, accomplishments that Joanne may be most grateful for. And it's certainly um, that I want to speak for those people tonight because if they were here, that's what they would be talking about tonight. Or the opportunities they were given, the encouragements they were given. So Joanne has truly impacted the field. And I think being part of the Stanford community and being able to speak on behalf of those women, it's a real privilege for me tonight. Um, I would like to just say thank you um, to Joanne. Um, thank you on behalf of um, all the people that she has supported, including myself, um, as a guest lecturer once a year. Um, I came into Joanne's classes just nervous um, and feeling very vulnerable being in front of this group. And, and the thought of doing that uh, year round um, made me a little bit uh, nuts. But <clears throat> more than anything, by doing the reading, by being a part of Joanne's classes, even just once a year, I was individually transformed into a more thoughtful person um, and a better person uh, because of the learning that I did there. And so I want to say personally thank you. Um, here's Joanne. Thank you from all of us. Thank you. It has been a very hard journey. It has been filled with years of death threats, and the idea that I'm fearless is nonsense. Um, but I really appreciated that very, very much. Um, Meyer and I talked, and rather than talk personally in our thank you, we thought we'd be very brief. And the one thing I'd like to say is I never would have survived if it weren't for you and the women who aren't here tonight, who were in the MBA classes and who consistently dared to speak up. So thank you. Um, Myra is going to come up here. And rather than talking about the past or about our personal selves, we thought we'd talk about the future and be very brief, because I know you have lots of other things on the schedule. We divided up the world, and my job is to say how the business school should change, and Myra's going to tell you how all of business should change. <laughs> I'm not known for mincing my words, so I'm going to be very blunt. We are in real trouble in the business school because we have no full-time, tenure-line, or tenured women who really focus on gender in the business school. Myra's appointment is in the ed school. Deb Meyerson's appointment is in the ed school primarily. And although these two women are dynamite teachers and first-rate researchers, the future does not look good. And it won't change unless you pressure the right people to get a woman who really focuses on gender research. Myra's retired. She will teach these kinds of courses for a while. Deb is overwhelmingly busy, and she too would like to teach these courses for a while, but we need a business school person. So I see your heads nodding. Who do you need to talk to? Number one, the OB faculty, who will tell you that they have lots of reasons for hiring lots of people and none of them are gender. The gender isn't sufficiently important in mainstream. Number two, David Kreps. Number three, Garth Saloner, who's in charge of the new curriculum. Which brings me to number two on my list, which is the new curriculum. The people in charge of the core courses in the new curriculum, separately, one by one, have decided there will be no gender content to the new curriculum in the core courses. That is a sin of the first order. Now, deans and faculty listen to you, but you have to speak up. There is absolutely no excuse why groups, leadership, and OB, to name just three, not to mention the CAT course, 
could have absolutely no content whatsoever to do with the gender. In that school of ours, they had a leadership course a year and a half ago. And at that leadership course, which was student-led, there were absolutely all male leaders. You guys should be ashamed of yourselves. How could you let that happen? And having let it happen, how could you not, now that you know about it, complain mightily, strongly, and all the time about the fact that we need women. We need women like Beth Cross, who will come into our classes and role model what's possible. We need women protagonists in cases. And by that, I don't mean the Harvard method, which has sometimes been to simply change Fred to Sally and keep the content of the case the same. <laughs> what you want is a case that stars Sally, and Sally deals in some way with a gender-related issue. So I want to encourage you not to be complicit and not to be silent. You never will have more power than right now if you're a current MBA student. Go pressure the faculty and pressure the deans and get women's things in there, because people like Myra and I cannot survive without your support. I'm finished now, and I'd like to say just one thing, which is there's a big difference between being a lecturer and being a tenure-line professor. Myra was not a lecturer, ever. She came as an assistant professor, and instead of having, as the lecturer does, just to teach one course or two courses, she also had to carry her full share of all the administrative citizenship that a tenure faculty member carries. I figure over time it's 20, 30 hours a week. And in addition, she had to produce enough research in a brand new area called feminist economics to convince people across the country that she was one of the best, one, two, or three best economists in the entire nation. That's a much bigger job. So when you look for faculty who focus on gender, make sure you ask the question, is this a lecturer or is this a tenure line professor? Because it's all the difference in the world. And it'll get future students to get content in courses that really is based on research and that you can really trust to hold true over time. So now I'm going to turn it over to Byra. And I, having fixed the business school, will now <laughs> hear how the business world can be fixed. why it's been such a delight to work with Joanne all these years. Yes, we've been partners, that's to, for sure. To rabble rouse together. Um, I want to start with one point which is relevant to both the business school and the work world, and it's a point that was made on the panel this afternoon, and it's about speaking up. And it's about speaking up when some sexist incident occurs. And my husband, Jay, and I have had the privilege this year of uh, facilitating some WIM plus men groups. So it's the original WIM group plus six men who've been invited. And one of the issues that has come up in several instances is what to do in a situation where a faculty member makes a sexist remark in class or perhaps outside of class. And, you know, should you say something, should you not say something? And I think both Joanne and I would agree that, and, and the panel agreed earlier today, that not saying something is not the right answer, that you really do need to speak up. That said, you don't necessarily have to speak up in class. You don't have to raise your hand and be the one to say, you said that. You can go quietly uh, to the faculty member's office um, and say something. And even better, you can take a male classmate with you. And one of the things that has come up in the WIM plus men groups is that there are many men in your classes who sometimes don't see what you see, but once it's pointed out to them, are very willing to go with you to talk to a professor, or sometimes do see it and are just waiting for you to ask. Uh, about what could be done about it. So don't let these incidents go by because then they happen again year after year after year and no progress is made. The same thing is true in the workplace where perhaps it's a little harder because the stakes are higher. 
but don't let things go by. Check them out, as um, Mary said today, check them out, make sure that, that uh, you're on the right track about something, but do speak up, do say something. And then, as I said uh, briefly on the panel, if you're thinking about leaving the workforce for uh, some period of time because you can't seem to find the flexibility you have um, at your job, um, think about the future. Think about how you're going to come back and maintain your contacts, maintain your skills, um, and try to stay out for as short a period as you can. And related to that, um, another point that was made today, uh, don't, don't judge other women um, who have made the decision to leave because you don't know why. Um, instead, spend your efforts trying to change your workplace so that fewer women and fathers uh, have to leave the workplace in order to balance work and family. Um, when Adlai Stevenson gave a very famous commencement address, he said, as you leave this place, don't forget why you came. And I say the same thing. You came here to honor Joanne and me. The, the best way you can honor us is go out to your workplaces and change them yes. so that women and men can succeed. Yes. Thank you. <laughs>